So I've made several references to entrepreneurial teams. What about them? Why are they so good? Well, here's some reasons why two or more are better than one. Uh, you have um, more access uh, to resources, both personal resources and in your network resources. Uh, hopefully you can bring different uh, skill sets to the table. It gives you someone to share the workload when there's so much to be done early on and you're bootstrapping it, then this is a way to uh, get more done. And then we can't forget just the moral support. When you're having a good day, <clears throat> you may be able to lift up your partners that are having a bad day and are ready to throw in the towel. But let me tell you that of, of all the topics that we talk about in entrepreneurship, this is perhaps the one that should scare you the most. And by that I mean there is no gift greater than a great partner. And there is no curse greater than a bad partner. And so this idea of bringing on teammates is a fundamental decision that carries great risk uh, with it. I'm going to make a couple of references in here to marriage. And it really is very much like that with a few important differences. Just like the person that you marry and you bring into your life is just so key to you and, and such a determinant of your happiness in life. The same is true of a partner. It's going to have so much to do with your day-to-day -day happiness and ultimately your success. Now, uh, at the bottom of the screen or on the slide, I pasted in here a table that uh, is out of my undergraduate textbook that I use, and it talks about, quote-unquote, the ideal entrepreneur. And it talks about the ideal is a team, but also you get the idea of some higher education. I'm not sure I buy that one so much. But then you notice they're looking for relevant experience, both in the industry and in entrepreneurship, seldom happens that way. Uh, and then broad, and pro broad networks, broad reach, large, uh, so that you can reach out to a large group of people and they will help you. So here is the $64 question. When it comes to picking teammates, do you want people who are like you or are very different than you? And we would have, if we were in a face-to-face -face class, a great discussion on this point, but I'm gonna short circuit it completely and say the answer to that question is yes. You want people that are like you, and you want people that are different than you. Say what? <clears throat> you do not want people different than you on these kinds of issues. Goal for the business, work ethic, integrity, basic value in terms of uh, are we going to try to be a cost leader, or are we going to try to be uh, very much competing with uh, differentiators that are going to allow us to charge a premium price. These are fundamental differences. I cannot imagine being married to somebody I didn't trust completely, and I'm blessed to have someone I trust completely. Likewise, I cannot imagine going into business someone I could not trust completely, because you can never protect yourself completely. So to me, integrity is number one, and there are no variances allowed on integrity. <clears throat> Something you should be very intolerant of differences is on goals for the business. And incidentally, this doesn't mean crooked or not crooked. For example, what if one partner is wanting to start the business looking to quickly grow it and sell it versus another partner that really is looking to run this business for the next 20 or 30 years? Fundamental differences they are going to cause problems down the line. How about another example? One partner wants to start a business to maximize the overall value of the company in terms of making money, whereas the other partner is trying to create a business that they're going to be able to bring their family members in over time and have the next generation occupy leadership positions. Both of these are perfectly legitimate and worthy goals, but you can see if they're in the same team by the founders, it's going to be problematic. <clears throat> so these core tenets, values, integrity, work ethic, uh, goals for the business, those you need to be the same on. The things where it's good to be different on are the knowledge, skills, and abilities. So you could have a business where somebody is a great marketing person, very outgoing. The other is a genius writing code, and it's a business where writing code would be helpful. <clears throat> you have, like I said earlier, different networks of friends, different industry experiences where you're trying to merge two industries together. It would be great if you each came from that uh, different industry that you were trying to merge into one category. So don't fall into the trap of do you want to be the same or different. I want to have both, but I want to be very selective in the areas where I'm similar and very selective in the areas where I'm different than my partner. And then a piece of advice I would give you right up front is when you go into that partnership, <clears throat> when everybody's happy and we're all going to get rich and this is going to be great and going to be a lot of fun, put things out in a founder's agreement. 
the things on the slides are the things that should be in a founders agreement. Let me talk to you about the critical ones, role of the founders. Maybe we all thought that I was going to write code for this company because I know how to write code and I'm thinking I am absolutely launching this business because I want to get away from writing code. Well, that could be problematic down the line. This idea of ownership, and then that gets into their con consideration for the idea. Whose idea was it? Who's putting money into it? Who's putting sweat equity into it, which is simply work without pay is what sweat equity is. So <clears throat> you have three people starting a company. Do you go 33, 33, 33? can almost guarantee you that's the wrong answer probably, but those are issues that should be worked out and put into writing. And then you get that word behind the ownership percentages, percentages, the idea of vesting. Don't make the mistake of saying, okay, we went one third, one third, one third, we each own a third of the company, here we go. And then six months into it, person C has this terrible financial crisis, or I'm sorry, family crisis, where they really need to drop out of the business, get a job where they've got benefits again, blah, blah, blah. They need to go their separate ways. Well, do you still want them owning 33% of the business? No. Well, are you going to buy them out? Well, how much are you going to buy them out for? Much easier if you have vesting, which is to say, for example, we all, all own, we're all eventually going to own 33% of the business. However, we only gain that ownership percentage at 1% a month or a half a percent a month or 2% a month. So that if I leave after 6%, or six months, instead of owning 33% of the company, I own 6% of the company. And then that gets that bottom bullet of a buyback clause. This is one of the area where it's unlike marriage. You do want to create, going in, the possibility of an amicable divorce, something I wouldn't recommend in a marriage. Go all in in a marriage. But in entrepreneurship, create the grounds for an amicable divorce. And so you do that by putting terms in the founder's agreement. How are we going to value the shares of stock? We're going to set it up that we have the first right to buy back the stock from the departing member. And that gets the bullet above it, the ownership of the intellectual property. One of the things you're going to see that's critical to get investors is the company has to own the intellectual property, not one of the founders. If one of the founders insists on maintaining ownership of the intellectual property, then basically there's going to have to be a, a, a permanent license where the company gets to use the intellectual property without payment. So making sure that the company has good access to the intellectual property is going to be a part of a successful founder's agreement uh, down the line. To wrap it up, like I said, one of the reasons it's all this thing of teams or of individuals having to have certain traits doesn't type out is because there are such things as teams. So you do have people, you have the quiet introvert who's brilliant, but you don't want dealing with people or is crushed when they have to deal with people. Follow with the extrovert who loves dealing with people but frankly isn't nearly as smart as the introvert. These are why all these issues become very complicated or why things don't test out like you think they should but that's the beauty of a team is it can take individuals who have specific roles to play, significant roles to play and tap into them without worrying about the deficiencies that they have. In the next uh, series of videos I'm going to start talking about the opportunity and creativity. You're really going to enjoy that. Join me then.